Hi, I'm Rob with Subways I.O. We're back with something new. In this one, we're traveling from Brooklyn to Manhattan, keeping our focus on the elevated network. This time, we're diving into the 9th Avenue elevated with a special look at the towering Harlem and Morningside superstructure. A question we've received concerns the height of a segment of the 9th Avenue elevated, specifically the curve around 110th Street. This stretch held the title of the tallest segment in the elevated and subway network from its opening in 1879 until 1933, when it was surpassed by the IND. Why did the line require such a high structure? The answer lies in geography and tractive effort. The route along Columbus Avenue encounters a significant elevation change between 104th and 108th streets. This is where the limitations of the steam era come into play. Let's take a quick look at the 9th Avenue Line, New York City's first elevated railway. It dates back to 1868, beginning with the Greenwich Street section built by Charles T. Harvey. During the 1870s, the line steadily expanded north along Manhattan's west side, reaching Harlem by 1879. Originally, the line spanned roughly 10 miles, running from South Ferry to 155th Street, which remained its terminal until 1918. That year, the line was extended six more miles to Woodlawn, connecting with the Jerome Avenue line. Now, let's dive into the 104th to 125th Street section and its impressive structural height. A major factor in rail design is handling elevation changes. Elevated lines in the steam era had to account for push-pull operations, tractive effort, rail adhesion, and braking. While the Forney locomotive was built for steeper grades, standard elevated railway grades were typically limited to 2% or less. To maintain a relatively level track, certain sections had to be built at excessive heights. This was the case with the suicide curve on the 9th Avenue elevated. Columbus Avenue's natural drop was a major challenge. Between 104th and 110th streets, the elevation dropped by approximately 60 feet, with an additional 17-foot drop between 110th Street and 125th streets. The high structure was necessary to compensate for these changes while keeping the track within acceptable grade limits. From the north, the line began its climb just beyond the 125th Street platform to accommodate the elevation change along Columbus Avenue. Keeping the grade at 2% or less required an extended distance to ascend the 60 feet needed to clear the height at 104th Street. The climb continued until around 118th Street, where it leveled off for the 116th Street station. South of the station, the line resumed its ascent, reaching its required height just north of the curve at 110th Street and 8th Avenue. This was the infamous suicide curve, named for the tragic events where individuals leapt from this section to their deaths. The track level here stood approximately 66 feet above the street, with the ground sloping downward from west to east. When the line opened in 1879, there was no stop at 110th Street. The station and its middle track were later added. This meant that from 1879 to 1903, the 116th Street station held the title of the tallest elevated station in the network. Meanwhile, 92nd Street and 34th Street stations on the 2nd Avenue line weren't far behind. Did you know that both the 116th and 110th Street stations had elevator houses for station access? 116th Street was one of the first stations to deploy elevator access, with 110th opening with it in 1903. Remnants of these structures remained well into the 1960s and 70s. Here are a few views of this section over the years. The 1879 section of the 9th Avenue line featured a different structural setup than its southern counterpart. It utilized a Phoenix iron structure built by the historic Phoenix Bridge Company, a subsidiary of a firm dating back to just after the Revolutionary War in the Lehigh Valley. The Phoenix Bridge Company not only supplied materials for the 9th Avenue elevated, but also for the 2nd Avenue, 6th Avenue, and Brooklyn's Fulton Street elevated between 1878 and 1894. What made these structures unique was the Phoenix Column, a patented design consisting of riveted wrought iron pieces forming a hollow column. This method created a structure that was both lighter and stronger than the solid and lattice cast iron columns commonly used at the time. 
As a result, lines like the 2nd Avenue Elevated could accommodate heavier subway equipment. Here's a view of the converted composite cars operating on the 2nd Avenue local, something that wasn't possible just a block west on the 3rd Avenue line due to its 64,000 pound weight limit on local tracks. Heavier car types like the composites and later the Q types would typically run light on local tracks and were only used in service on express tracks. With the composites weighing over 70,000 pounds, the Second Avenue line, which had no such weight restrictions, made this local service operation feasible. The upper section of the Ninth Avenue line could handle heavier loads without issue. However, south of 81st Street, structural constraints arose due to the Y-column design used in the southern sections of the line. Want to dive even deeper into the Manhattan Elevated? Our new Fast Track membership gives you exclusive access to even more history and behind-the-scenes content. With Fast Track, you'll get your exclusive content, special posts, detailed breakdowns, and behind-the-scenes insights. Early access watch major releases up to five days before the public live chats. Join us for exclusive Q&A sessions and discussions. If you're into rail history and technology, consider joining Fast Track to support our work and unlock even more content. Now, let's get back to the 9th Avenue Elevated. The line played a key role in transforming the area from rural in 1879 to develop neighborhoods within about a decade. The IRT's Contract 1 expansions in 1904 along Broadway and Lenox Avenue fueled a population boom on the Upper West Side and in Harlem, with the 9th Avenue line positioned right in between. The IRT took over the Manhattan Elevated in 1903. Under the IRT, this section of the line was upgraded with a full center track for peak direction express service, serving both 6th and 9th Avenue trains. Express trains ran to and from the Bronx, reaching as far north as Woodlawn, 116th Street and 125th Street functioned as express stations, while 110th Street remained a local stop. This upgrade also altered station configurations slightly, introducing staggered platforms. The challenge was fitting two island platforms within the profile of the existing structure. This was typically achieved by adding extended columns over the sidewalk, positioned within a reasonable distance from the property line. However, due to the height of the structure, this wasn't an easy setup. The solution? Utilize the extra side space on the structure and stagger the platforms, allowing the center track to curve to accommodate both platforms. A clever and innovative design. The curve was surpassed in height in 1933 by the IND Smith 9th Street Station, which stood approximately 25 feet taller. Many other sections of the Steam Era elevated network had to maintain specific elevations due to the surrounding terrain as well. On the 2nd Avenue line, notable elevation changes occurred in the Upper East Side, near 92nd Street, in East Midtown just south of 57th Street, and in Murray Hill, where the 34th Street station maintained a level grade. Similarly, the 3rd Avenue line had to accommodate elevation shifts around the 99th Street station and its adjacent maintenance shop. Later rapid transit expansions, such as the dual contracts projects, were less constrained by grade limitations, though energy efficiency remained a factor. The introduction of electric multiple units significantly improved performance, as seen on lines like Route 18 or the White Plains Road line and Route 16 or the Jerome Avenue line. Did you know that north of East 180th Street, Route 18 encounters a series of grades exceeding 3%? Between East 180th and 233rd Street stations, the line climbs an impressive 120 feet in elevation, making East 233rd Street the highest station in the network in terms of absolute elevation. While Smith 9th remains the tallest station from street level to track, East 233rd sits roughly 200 feet above sea level. Here's a look at the 3.5% grade climb on the White Plains Road Line. The Jerome Avenue Line also features significant elevation changes, with the steepest grade occurring between Burnside Avenue and 183rd Street, where the track ascends at a 3% incline. Had these lines been designed and built just a few decades earlier, they likely would have looked much different due to the engineering constraints of the time. The 9th Avenue line, along with the infamous suicide curve, closed in June 1940 with demolition beginning that fall. This marked the end of the structure's incredible 61-year reign. Even though the line is long gone, traces of it remain, if you know where to look. Take this building line, for example. We can see where the line curved off Columbus Avenue. And further up the route, the I-13 162nd Street connection tunnel are still intact but sealed. 
The towering 9th Avenue structures over Columbus and 8th Avenue stand as a testament to Victorian-era engineering designed to accommodate a growing and expanding city. That wraps up another look back for us, another visual letter from the past. We'll be back with more content covering Manhattan in the future. If you enjoyed this and want to see more, please give us a like and subscribe. If you'd like to support our work, consider buying us a coffee. The link is in the description. This is Rob with Subways.io, signing off. Until next time.